Hi, my name is Akihiro Ando. I am an orofacial pain and oral medicine specialist. Thank you very much for viewing this lecture. And now I will always mention this in the beginning of the textbook review session, but in the lecture, I will only discuss about what is written in the textbook and try to avoid mentioning my own opinion or my clinical experience. So unless otherwise stated, what I say is pretty much what is written in the textbook. If you'd like to learn about the most current research, please go to PubMed and search for an article by yourself. Also, if you'd like to learn about my insights based on my clinical experience as an orofacial pain and oral medicine specialist, then please attend my lecture or a seminar. Today, I will review a chapter called Burning Mouth Syndrome an update on diagnosis and treatment methods. It is a chapter from this book written by Dr. Glenn Clark and Dr. Dion. This is very well written textbook and one of my favorite. Not only because it was written by my mentor, Dr. Clark, when I was a resident at USC, but because it cites various articles and provides evidence based on information on the discussed topic. This book is available on Amazon as a hard copy as well as an ebook. So if you are interested in reading this book, please purchase one for yourself. I will start with characteristics and diagnosis and then cover epidemiology and etiology followed by comorbidity and finally the management of burning mouth syndrome. So let's start from characteristic and diagnosis of burning mouth syndrome. Burning mouth syndrome is characterized by a triad of symptoms. Number one, burning sensation of the mouth. It presents daily and persisting for most of the day. Typically, oral mucosa is of normal appearance, and by definition, other local or systemic disease must be excluded. It usually occurs spontaneously and gradually worsen over time. IASP, International Academy for Study of Pain, defines burning mouth syndrome being oral burning pain episodes lasting at least four to six months. So by definition, it is chronic. Number two, this burning pain is commonly accompanied by taste disturbance called metallic dyskusia. So it feels like you are licking a metallic spoon or having a battery inside of your mouth. Another commonly reported symptom is xerostomia. Now xerostomia doesn't necessarily mean diminished salivary flow because when salivary flow is measured, most often it comes out normal. So xerostomia does not mean hyposalivation, but it just means dry feeling of the mouth. A common report is that their symptom gets worse when they eat acidic food. But sometimes patients report loss of taste or paresthesia of involved sight. Most commonly affected sight is the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, especially at the tip of the tongue. This could be because the taste buds density is 4.6 times higher on the tip than the mid-tongue region. The lips are also affected as well as the anterior hard palate and alveolar ridges. But buccal mucosa and the floor of the mouth are almost never involved. Lamy's group suggested three subgroups of burning mouth syndrome depending on their pain pattern. So number one, pain increasing throughout the day, peaking in the evening. Number two, continuous sensory disturbance throughout the day. And number three, intermittent symptoms with pain-free periods during the day. When diagnosing burning mouth syndrome, all local and systemic disease must be ruled out. So all the lab tests should turn out normal. When there is any abnormality found, 
they will be categorized as secondary burning mouth syndrome and the treatment will be focused on the underlying pathology causing burning sensation of the mouth. It is interesting to note that one paper published by Dan Hauser's group in 2002 examined 69 burning mouth syndrome patients and asked them to fill out both the multidimensional pain inventory and symptom checklist 90 revised. The study found that the primary burning mouth syndrome patients and the secondary burning mouth syndrome patients showed no difference with respect to age, pain duration, pain intensity, or levels of psychological distress. Burning sensation of the mouth is not uncommon and can be caused by many underlying disorders. Iron deficiency anemia and pernicious anemia are known to cause depapillation of the tongue and may cause burning sensation of the mouth. Other vitamin and mineral deficiencies can cause pain in the mouth too, such as zinc, vitamin B2, 9, or other vitamin B family. Oral infections, such as candidiasis, or just poor oral hygiene, could also cause similar pain. Even infection caused by immunosuppression due to HIV infection, use of immunosuppressive medications, or uncontrolled diabetes should also be ruled out. Allergies involving cinnamon, dyes, food additives, and chemical irritations are reported to cause burning sensations of the mouth. Autoimmune disease like lichen planus, endocrine disorders, hyper or hypo, and GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disorder, may cause burning sensation too. Xerosomia can be caused by aging, medication-induced, or Sjogren's syndrome. Now, all of these conditions will be categorized as secondary burning mouth syndrome. As you can tell, there are quite a few lists of conditions you need to rule out in order to diagnose primary burning mouth syndrome. There are some medications known to cause dysgeusia or burning pain. For dysgeusia, tetracycline, which is an antibiotic, lithium carbonate used to treat mania associated with bipolar disorder, D-penicillamine known as anti-rheumatic drug, and captopril for the treatment of hypertension. Also used for the treatment of hypertension, ACE inhibitors are reported to cause burning pain of the oral mucosa. There are reports stating possible salivary and serologic biomarkers of burning mouth syndrome. In 2007, Chen's group studied on serum interleukin-6 levels in patients with burning mouth syndrome. A relationship was found between this chemical, interleukin-6, with depression and pain. Interleukin-6 was decreased in patients with burning mouth syndrome it was negatively correlated with chronic pain. Interleukin-6 has some important functions, including glia proliferation, neuronal survival and differentiation, axonal regeneration, and pro-inflammatory activities. So this group considered that low interleukin-6 could modulate these functions and aggravate hyperalgesia. Exogenous administration of interleukin-1-beta is known to aggravate hyperalgesia, and Wolf's group evaluated on the polymorphism of gene associated with production of interleukin-1-beta. However, they could not determine whether interleukin-1-beta high producer genotype is associated with pain sensitivity and or depression symptoms associated with the syndrome. Simsix group Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, but provided the presence of interleukin-2 and interleukin-6 in all saliva specimens and the concentration of these cytokines were significantly increased in the patients with burning mouth syndrome when compared to the controls. However, in 2009, SUS group and again, I'm sorry, 
I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly or not. I apologize on that. And they found no difference in the salivary levels of interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and TNF-alpha in patients with burning mouth syndrome compared with control group. So unfortunately, there are still no consistent report of any biomarkers. Histopathologic findings appears to be normal in primary BMS patients. However, one report shows a specific staining reveals one different finding when comparing burning mouth syndrome and normal controls. So I will discuss about this in the latter part of this lecture. Now I will talk about findings from different quantitative sensory testings. A couple of reports covered neurosensory threshold testing and Lamy's group reported no difference in object size perception ability was found between burning mouth syndrome patients and controls. Svensson's group reported sensory thresholds were significantly higher in burning mouth syndrome patients and the ratios between pain and sensory thresholds were significantly lower in burning mouth syndrome patients. The widespread sensory threshold differences seen in this study argues for a centrally mediated sensory amplification abnormality. Jaskalanian's group reported that there is a clear-cut alterations in blink reflex testing. Gao's group examined evoked brainwave potentials after lingual nerve stimulation and found the pain thresholds were significantly lower and evoked potential response latencies were significantly different in the painful burning mouth syndrome group. Overall data suggests peripheral and or central nervous system changes are clearly present in burning mouth syndrome. There are a few reports on taste threshold changes in burning mouth syndrome. Ultra-metallic taste is commonly reported by burning mouth syndrome patients. Some reports on diminished ability to detect bitter flavors and spicy and acidic food increase their burning sensations. Now let's cover epidemiology of burning mouth syndrome. Population study reports up to 4% of all adults. It is common before the age of 30, female over the age of 50 are the common burning mouth syndrome patients. Onset in women usually occurs within three to 12 years after menopause. There are five possible etiologies covered in this chapter of the textbook. A dysfunction of the cordal tympani nerve, small afferent fiber atrophy, upregulated trip v one receptor, CNS pain pathway and dopamine receptor alteration, and burning mouth syndrome is an autoimmune disorder similar to lichen planus. First, let's talk about a dysfunction of the corda tympani nerve. As you all know, corda tympani is a branch of the facial nerve responsible for the sensation of taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Other sensory signals of the same region, such as pain or touch, are transmitted through third branch of the trigeminal nerve. Now, Bartoschuk's group's essential theory is that burning mouth pain symptoms occur when there is an abnormal interplay between lingual nerve function and cordal tympani function. The same group reported that the super tasters, who are known to have large number of fungiform papillae, are at risk of developing burning mouth syndrome. Eliva, Eliav, Sorry, it's so hard to pronounce authors' names, right? Well, they reported 18 out of 22 of burning mouth syndrome patients are suspected to have possible corda tympani dysfunction. 
Surgical trauma-induced burden mouth syndrome are reported after an autologic procedures, and this is probably related to surgical damage of corda tympani nerve. Peretz group reported 47% of those received middle ear surgery reported numbness, tingling, reduction in sensitivities to light touch, and two points discrimination on the treated side. However, the group of patients in this reported study were young, and these symptoms reduced to baseline with no BMS development. One possible etiology is small afferent fiber atrophy of the tongue. In 2002, Four cells group reported 52 burden mouth syndrome patients receiving quantitative sensory testing with blink reflex. An alteration was seen in 90% of these individuals. And another study related to small afferent fiber atrophy is this, published by Loria's group in 2005. This is an interesting study which performed tongue biopsy with special staining, comparing healthy individuals and burning mouth syndrome patients. 12 burning mouth syndrome patients were found to have lower density of epithelial nerve fibers compared to the healthy controls. This is suggestive of axonal degeneration also seen in the patients with diabetic neuropathy. TRPV1 receptor or TRPV1 receptor upregulation is another speculation. Now, TRPV1 is heat and capsaicin receptor and responsible for local release of CGRP and substance P. It is seen after peripheral nerve injury. Inflammation enhances nerve growth factor or NGF production and nerve shrouding occurs with upregulation of TRPV1 and increase in substance P. So in 2007, Yimna's group, Yilma's group, Yilma's group reported upregulation of trip V1 in nerve fibers in the patients with BMS. Multiple publications have shown the association between trip V1 and burning pain. Now, central nervous system pain, or CNA pain pathway, and dopamine receptor alteration in the basal ganglia may take a role in burn and mouth syndrome. Hegelberg's group conducted two researches and reported, one, the presynaptic dopaminergic function was significantly decreased in the putamen of the burn and mouth syndrome patients compared with control subjects. Two, that a decline in endogenous dopamine levels in the putamen was present in burn and mouth syndrome patients. The number of available striatal D2 receptors is thought to dictate the extent of central pain suppression and the dysfunction may lead to a chronic pain not only limited to burn and mouth syndrome. So these studies suggest not only in peripheral but central pain pathway alteration is involved in burning mouth syndrome. Now, Srinivasan's group suggested possible relationship between burning mouth syndrome and lycoplanus because both conditions have elevated expression of CD14 mRNA and decreased level of TLR2 mRNA in their saliva. So what are some other common comorbid systemic diseases? Burning mouth syndrome is more commonly seen in middle-aged female patients. So the relationship between hormonal changes in women that occur with menopause and burning mouth syndrome is still not clear. For Bosco's group reported 15 out of 27 patients with burning mouth syn syndrome improved with hormonal replacement therapy, or HRT. However, this is an open-label study, and there are other reports with conflicting outcomes. 
So more of well-designed trials is desired. Now patients with BMS or Bernie Mao syndrome often have high blood glucose levels, but this does not occur on a consistent basis, so no causal relationship has been demonstrated. Reports on nutritional deficiencies are also reported, but with inconsistent results. Well, it needs to be ruled out anyway to distinguish primary and secondary burning mouth syndrome. What about psychological factors? Browning's group reported positive psychiatric diagnoses were more commonly seen in burning mouth syndrome patients than controls. However, it is not unusual or the reported rate is not even high when compared with other chronic pain patients and therefore cannot conclude a direct link between psychiatric disease with burning mouth syndrome. High levels of anxiety, depression, or even somatization tendencies are not unusual or unique to burning mouth syndrome patients. So let's move on to the management strategies for burning mouth syndrome. There are two possible ways to treat burning mouth syndromes. One is cognitive behavioral therapy and the other is pharmacotherapy. In cognitive behavioral therapy, sessions of one hour per week for 12 to 15 weeks are recommended. It is reported to reduce pain for up to six months and reported that it works better with alpha lipoic acid. Group psychotherapy is also reported to be beneficial. So pharmacologic therapies, four medications are discussed here. Clonazepam, gabapentin, alpha lipoic acid, and antidepressants or antipsychotics. Topical clonazepam is the most widely accepted treatment for burning mouth syndrome. One milligram of clonazepam, three times daily, rinse for three minutes and expectorate. Blood level of clonazepam was measured after the use and found that blood concentration of clonazepam being extremely low, which suggests its topical effect on painful sight. Gabapentin is commonly used for peripheral neuropathy, but its effect for burning mouth syndrome is not well evaluated. Now, alpha lipoic acid is an antioxidant, and it is known to have pain suppressing effect on diabetic neuropathy. However, since there are opposing results from multiple studies, and this benefit may be from placebo. Mena's group evaluated amisulpride, paroxetine, and sertraline for their effect on burning mouth syndrome. Of these three, amisulpride was found to have a pain suppressing effect. It is fastest acting dopamine D2 and D3 receptor inhibitor. Sardellus evaluated the effect of St. John's wort, and no difference was found in treatment group and control group. Now, Demarosi's group evaluated the effect of levosulpride, or levosulpride, which is also a dopamine D2 receptor inhibitor. Although some effects were reported, there are no cured case reported too. Here are some reviews on the treatment of burning mouth syndrome. In 2003, Zach Zacher Zelska's group found that none of the trials examined were able to provide conclusive evidence of high effectiveness. However, they also reported that cognitive behavioral therapy may be beneficial in reducing the intensity of the symptoms. In 2007, reviews from Minguez and Patton's groups were published. Minguez's group concluded that neither capsaicin nor clonazepam administered systemically via the oral route is effective 
and has moderately bothersome adverse reactions. Now, gabapentin has not shown efficacy, but alpha-lipoic acid was found to be better than placebo. However, it loses efficacy over time. They concluded that topical clonazepam seems to be the best treatment approach. Patton's group also concluded that both topical clonazepam and cognitive behavioral therapy have proven to be effective. So in this textbook review lecture, I separated this chapter in these five topics. Characteristic of Burning Mouth Syndrome is this common triad of symptoms. Many conditions have to be ruled out before diagnosing it as primary Burning Mouth Syndrome. Now, burning mouth syndrome is very uncommon in, the, in under the age of 30, and most patients are over 50 years of age. There are quite a few possible etiology, but most likely that there are peripheral and central involvement. Involvement of hormones, blood sugar, psychological factors are suspected, but with varying outcomes from different studies. Cognitive behavioral therapy and pharmacotherapies are the treatment of choice for management of burning mouth syndrome. So that wraps up this chapter and you can download a handout from the description box, the link below. If you are interested in studying about orofacial pain, I do recommend you to purchase this te textbook. It is available on Amazon, a hard copy as well as an ebook version. Well, thank you very much for listening or viewing this lecture and please click subscribe if you would like to receive a further update from this channel. Thank you very much. Have a great day.